Hello, dear friends. It is time for our midweek Bible study for Wednesday, May the 13th, 2020 at the Westside Church of Christ in Alvin, Texas. I hope this video finds you all doing well. I want to especially welcome those who may be visiting with us and viewing the class today. I'm honored that you've chosen to be with us to study God's Word. I want to encourage all of our Westside family to be sure and check your email for our Wednesday announcements and prayer list if you've not already done so. We want, of course, to always be praying for those on our prayer list and others that we may not even know about, asking God for his continued blessings and strength and courage and healing, but also thanking the Lord for those who are getting better. And we're so thankful that there are those on our list this week who uh, continue to get better, and we're thankful to God for that, but we also pray on behalf of those that are still struggling. Before we begin our class, let's go to the Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you, dear God, for every day, every breath that you give us. Father, we thank you especially for your precious Son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to suffer so much on our behalf and then give his life as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross. And Father, we are so thankful just as he promised that on the third day of the week that you raised him from the dead with power and glory. And Father, we thank you for his death, for his resurrection, for the life that he makes possible for us because of your gift, your precious gift, Father. Dear God, we pray in a very special way for all of those that are on our prayer list this week. Dear Father, uh, there are others that I know that, uh, that we have forgotten, and Father, you know their needs, and we pray on their behalf. We pray on their behalf that they will be strengthened, that they will be encouraged as only you can and comforted, Father, but also, Father, that they will be brought back to their health very quickly. Father, we thank you for those who have been made well uh, or are in the process of getting well. We thank you, Father, for those blessings and uh, the doctors and nurses and medicines that you make possible, Father, and just for the power that we have in prayer, uh, praying on their behalf. Uh, Father, as we uh, move into this uh, study tonight, we pray that you will bless us in our effort. Dear God, as we now begin looking at the powerful resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on the first day of the week, Dear God, be with us and help us, Father, to always strive to walk in his steps. In Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as we begin our lesson today, we're now at the third day after Jesus was crucified and buried. The Feast of Unleavened Bread will continue for five and a half more days, but the High Sabbath in which they kept the Passover and also kept the Sabbath day is over now. It's completed. And now we are just before daybreak, perhaps 5.30, maybe 5.45 a.m. early Sunday morning, the first day of the new week. In this lesson, we're going to primarily lay the groundwork for the grand narrative of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As was the case with our Lord's death and burial, the resurrection story has many, many details. And details that I don't want to just skip over quickly, but details that we need to spend some time on. And so this being the case, we're going to be spending several weeks uh, just looking at the resurrection of Jesus. As we've been doing so since our study of Mark 11 began, remember we started out as a study of the Mark, Gospel of Mark, and we stayed generally just with Mark. But since Mark 11, which was the beginning of the last week of our Lord's life, since that time, we have continued incorporating information, important and vital information from the other Gospels uh, into our lessons on uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus particularly. Uh, we're going to continue to use uh, Mark's gospel as our primary source, 
But in fact, it won't surprise you that Mark's description of the resurrection is the shortest of the four Gospels. It is Luke and John which present us with the most detail and the longest narrative of those events. But Matthew particularly provides some very key information that he alone includes. So let's begin then reading together from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Mark 16, 1 through 13. And this information will cover everything that took place on the resurrection day that Mark includes. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country, and they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. So before we get into the text and the story of the resurrection, I feel like tonight that we need to deal with what I'm going to call the elephant in the room. And I think everyone will understand what that phrase means. There's something that doesn't seem right here as we're reading the scripture from our Bible. What is it with the last 12 verses of Mark? Should they be here or not? Let me say that the various translations handle Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20 in different ways. Some, like the ESV that I'm reading from, and I know some in the audience are reading from that uh, translation, some have a note between verse 8 and 9 with the following statement. And as you're reading your Bible, you probably noticed a statement something like this. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. Well, in the 1984 edition of the NIV, which I have in my library, it handles it much like the ESV with a slightly different notation. And I mentioned it's the 1984. There are, are, are editions later than that. But the one that I have in my uh, collection is uh, the 1984 edition. And it, it reads, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. The King James Version, the, R, the Revised Standard Version, make no notation at all concerning the last 12 verses. There are some manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, uh, although not nearly as ancient as the better, uh, the better text that we have, but there are some that replace verses 9 through 20 with the following. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Is it possible that Mark just abruptly ended his gospel in verse 8 and that was to be the end? Well, yes, it's possible. After all, uh, he does begin his gospel rather abruptly, leaving out the birth narrative entirely. In fact, forget, it begins, I'll remind you, with Jesus beginning his preaching. On the other hand, it seems a very strange place to end the letter, doesn't it? 
Is it possible the original ending was just lost somehow from the original document? Well, I'm going to say it's possible, but it does not seem likely. Surely the Holy Spirit would have made sure that it was included. Well, even though the section of verses 9 through 20, which is included in most modern English translations, does not appear in the two oldest Greek manuscripts that have been found thus far, they do appear, those words and those verses rather, 9 through 20, do appear in some very ancient manuscripts and early translations. Well, we could spend a lot of time talking about this and get into a lot of details of minutia that uh, I don't think would be helpful to our study. Um, the NIV, the English Standard Version, uh, I believe even the New American Standard are, are based on older texts of the of Greek. Um, some of the very, in fact, those very oldest uh, Greek texts uh, Greek tr uh, translations, Greek copies. Um, the King James and the uh, Revised Standard were based on later texts because the earlier texts were not available when they were translated. Well, I, I want to end this discussion. I realize I'm discussing with myself, but uh, I want to end this part of the study with these words that I think are really good from Brother Burton Kaufman. It's found in his introduction to the Gospel of Mark. This is what Brother Kaufman says, which I think makes a lot of sense. Much has been written concerning the last verses of the Gospel, in chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. The reason being that they are missing in some of the old Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Other manuscripts, again, contain a shorter version. The editors of the scientific edition of the Greek uh, New Testament, Nestle uh, Allen, do list verses 9 through 20, but they list the verses in double brackets, which means they are very old, but not considered to be original by the editors. By the editors. As these verses are contained in most of the Greek manuscripts and old translations, there is little doubt that the paragraph predates the manuscripts which omit or question it. Now, that's Brother Kaufman's. Uh, opinion, and I think it again. I think it it uh, is pretty a pretty solid opinion. The various scientists who do not consider the paragraph as original try to defend this opinion by advancing arguments to do with the style and contents of the passage. Now, there are some differences in the style, but that alone does not mean that they could not have been originally Mark's gospel. And Brother Kaufman finishes by saying, in my view, however, these have been contradicted sufficiently in the 19th century, among others by H. Olhausen, J.P. Lang, J.W. Bergen, C.F. Kale, which Brother Kale uh, wrote uh, an incredible set of Old Testament commentaries uh, with another gentleman named Dalich. And then Brother Kaufman mentions W. Kelly, and in more recent times by W. R. Farmer and J. Van Bruggen. And I know those names won't mean anything to you, but I just want to say that Brother Kaufman is basing this on some pretty, pretty solid um, scholarship here. Well, I've shared all this information with you. I, I didn't want to just pretend that those words are not written in our Bibles uh, about those verses not being in some of the older translation or older uh, texts. But I've shared this to let you know I'm going to take the position that Brother Kaufman does, that in fact verses 9 through 20 should be considered as part of the original uh, book, gospel, that Mark wrote. Well, let's move on. Let's go back now to Mark's description of the women arriving at the tomb. And we're going to spend most of our time in, in these four verses and other, uh, other passages from the other gospels. Uh, we're going to spend most of the rest of our time here. So in verse 1 of chapter 16 of Mark, I'm just going to read the first four verses again. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. We're told here that 
three of the women who were at the cross and remember had followed Joseph and Nicodemus to the garden tomb where they had laid Jesus and then rolled the stone in front of the tomb, that now they are on their way to the tomb once again. Now, I made the point at the end of our lesson last week that there are some who would try to come up with reasons to discredit the resurrection, who suggest that the women just go to the wrong tomb. Well, as I said last week, that's just preposterous. These women knew this area, and they've been here just a short time ago, watched Joseph and Nicodemus put Jesus' body in the tomb and roll the stone in front of it. They know exactly where the tomb is. They're not going to uh, a different tomb, and they're just confused. These ladies aren't confused. They know exactly what they're doing. Well, it is mentioned, they're, we're told here, they are Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, who is called in other places, Mary, the wife of Clopas. And then this third woman, who is named Salome. And uh, I've mentioned a number of times, we have every reason to believe, based on all of the gospel accounts, that this lady, Salome, was both the sister of Jesus' mother, Mary, and also the mother of his cousins, James and John, if She's Mary's sister, the James and John are Jesus' cousins. Matthew and Luke only mention the first two Marys, while John only focuses on Mary Magdalene. But for sure, these three women were there. Well, as I shared last week, Joseph and Nicodemus did their best preparing the body for burial, but they didn't have very much time, not nearly as much time as usually would have been taken. So, it appears that these women feel like the men could have not done the best job. Now, maybe that doesn't surprise us that they would feel that way. So they've come out to the tomb where they want to personally make sure that the body is prepared exactly the way it should be for a burial. And so they come to the tomb where they know Jesus was buried, bringing more spices with them. Now notice that they went just as soon as the sun had risen. So the sun is up now. Uh, so maybe we're, I don't know, 6.15, 6.30. We don't know, couldn't know exactly when the sun would have risen by now. Maybe it's 7 o'clock. Now the way they ask each other, by the way, who's going to roll the stone away? Who's going to help us? So they recognize that whether there's three women or six women, it's going to be difficult to roll the stone away. And they're wondering now, it's early in the morning, who's going to help us? But something has happened before they arrived. Uh, we don't know how soon the scripture would lead us to believe it happened before sunrise, perhaps just before sunrise. So maybe it took place 30 minutes an hour before they arrived. Again, it's hard to tell. We don't know exactly what time sunrise would have been. Mark just tells us that the women look up and behold, the stone has already been rolled away. So get this picture in your mind. They're getting close to the tomb and they're talking to each other. You know how you look around when you're talking and they're, they're, saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away? And suddenly they're in front of the tomb and they look and the stone has already been rolled away. I'm guessing they were speechless <laughs> at that moment. We'll see in a moment that there are actually two angels that are present, but apparently no one else. Now I say that, at least no one that they notice. They are clearly amazed at the open tomb and the, and the angels, and that's what their attention is on. So whether there were other people there, and I'll, I'll kind of clear up why I'm, I'm questioning that in just a few moments. But we know that they see the empty tomb. That's the important thing. Or at this point, the stone is rolled away from the tomb. They haven't gone inside yet. Well, Remember, I, I mentioned just a few moments ago that Matthew alone contains some important information. 
So I'm going to ask you to turn with me now to Matthew 28, verses 1 through 4. Matthew 28, 1 through 4. There Matthew writes, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So when the ladies left, wherever they were staying, whether it was in the city of Jerusalem or in Bethany or wherever it was, they must have left their homes or the place they're staying a little before sunrise because the sun will have risen by the time they get there. And before they get there, whether it happens before they leave their homes or it happens on their way, this event that Matthew describes takes place before they arrive at the, at the tomb because when they get there, the stone's already rolled away. So we need to go back now to Matthew chapter 27, the end of chapter 27, and read verses 62 to 66. And there we'll be reminded why the soldiers, who Matthew describes, trembled and became like dead men when the angel rolled the stone away, why they are there at the tomb. So let's pick up in verse 62 of Matthew 27. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said, while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead. And the last fraud, the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, I do think it's very interesting here that the chief priests and Pharisees knew of the prophecy that Jesus had made concerning his resurrection from the dead. Let me first comment that, again, we have two groups. The chief priests, which would have made up, been made up of Sadducees, and Pharisees, who were ordinarily enemies, <laughs> they couldn't agree on hardly anything. And yet they are brought together still by their hatred for Jesus. Well, although Jesus made these prophecies concerning his resurrection primarily to the apostles, remember there are always large groups of disciples nearby, including the women who were at the cross. and the Jewish leaders always had their spies lurking closely wherever Jesus went. So the fact that even the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem should have heard about Jesus' promises and his prophecies concerning the fact that he would rise again shouldn't surprise us. It is interesting that Matthew calls this day on which the Jewish leaders plead with Pilate for the guard to be placed at the tomb as the next day after the preparation. So now we are the day after Jesus was crucified and buried. That, remember, took place on the day of preparation, the preparation both for the Sabbath and for the Passover. Maybe it is that Matthew does not want to take away from the power of the story that he's telling here, but in fact, the Jewish leaders have gone to Pilate's hall to speak to him on the Sabbath day. They are working on the Sabbath. They are breaking their own traditions, the traditions they accuse Jesus of breaking. Their hypocrisy is just beyond remarkable. Now, it is certainly possible that these Jewish leaders are truly concerned that the disciples could steal the body when no one was watching. I, I grant that. 
But I want to suggest to you another possibility, and this is one of those times that I wish we could discuss, and I invite you to call me on my cell phone, 281-701-7847, text me, email me, and tell me what you think about this. But I want to suggest to you the possibility that although the Jewish leaders would never admit this to Pilate, that they could, in fact, be concerned that maybe Jesus could rise from the dead. And so they're going to do anything they can to stop it as though mortal men, even Roman soldiers, could stop the Son of God from rising from the dead. Well, it's just a thought. Let me know what you think. Ironically, the Jewish leaders are in fact outsmarting themselves, I think, as they're creating a situation in which the disciples of Jesus will be strengthened in their faith and others will be brought to faith rather than discouraged because there's going to be a Roman guard at the tomb when Jesus rises from the dead, and even they could not stop Jesus' resurrection. So what is the first fraud that they allude to in verse 64 that this last fraud would be worse than, that is, the stealing of the body? Well, I think almost certainly they're talking about Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. They believed him to be a fraud in that, a fraudulent Messiah. They did not believe that he was the Son of God. And so I believe that's the first fraud they're talking about. They wrongly think that they have been able to argue away this claim by their constant criticism and accusations against Jesus while he was alive. But combating an em empty tomb would be much more troublesome. So Pilate essentially tells them, okay, you take all the guards you need. You take my Roman seal and you make it as secure as you can. Don't you see irony in those words too? Make it as secure as you can. One well-known commentator has written, it was like trying to stop the wind with a machine gun. <laughs> well, history would tell us that this seal was made up of several ropes that would have been stretched across the tomb and secured to the rock that's beside the, the, the stone. And what they would do is they would take wax and they would attach the rope to the sides of the hill. And then they would impress those wax places with Pilate's seal, a Roman seal. And it almost certainly would have been the seal of Pilate. Well, I got to tell you, at this point, as I was thinking about this, it reminds me a lot of when I was in the Pearland High School band. At the end of the school year, we usually got to go on some kind of band trip, whether to uh, Dallas, uh, we went occasionally, uh, or I remember one year we went to Corpus Christi to the Buccaneer Band Festival. And I think that was my very first year to make a band trip. And what our band director, Mr. Ferris, would do, or would have some of those, uh, you know, adults, parents who were there chaperoning us, uh, at, at curfew, we were all to be in our rooms. And then he would take tape and put it on the edge of the door and extend it over to the door frame. So that if we left our rooms, the tape would be broken. Or if it wasn't broken, there would be no way to reattach the tape from the inside and we'd be caught. Well, I was kind of reminded of that by this Roman seal. But besides the seal, besides the seal, and I think it's important that the scripture says that the Jewish leaders they were in charge of that seal being placed and of placing the guard just where they wanted them. So there's a seal, multiple seals actually, and there is a Roman guard 
who have been charged by Pilate and would have been charged by Pilate to stay awake at all times on punishment of death and to make sure that no one got near the tomb. That was their charge. So the Jewish leaders put the seal in place and they set the guard exactly where they want them to be. Well, now go with me to Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 and 3 that we read just a few moments ago. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. And so there was an earthquake at our Lord's death at the very moment of his death. And now, as he is risen from the dead, from the grave, there's another great earthquake. Aren't they God's exclamation points? An angel of the Lord descends in front of these soldiers, mind you and rolls away the stone and sits on the stone. Can you imagine the scene and what the angel must have looked like? The scripture says the angel looked like lightning. His clothing is white as snow. That description sounds a lot like Jesus when he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, doesn't it? At the sight of the angel, and it is an angel. It's not Jesus. He's already risen. At the sight of the angel, the Roman soldiers were petrified and fell down unconscious as though they were dead. They were like dead men. They weren't really dead, but they were just like. It was like they were petrified and unconscious. I think it's extremely important that though the soldiers see the angel and the stone rolled back, they are not allowed to see Jesus himself rise from the grave. Jesus is already risen. In fact, not even the disciples are allowed to see that. Only the Father. No human being is allowed to see our Lord in that magnificent event of his resurrection from the dead. Well, how long were the Roman soldiers unconscious? Well, the scripture doesn't tell us. And, and I keep using that word unconscious. I, I think by what Matthew says, for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men, that they passed out. I, I guess there's no way I could prove that. That's what it sounds like. Let me know what you think. It's hard to tell how long they were like this in this condition. Um. Did they wake up, see the empty tomb, and then immediately run to tell the Jewish leaders what's happened before Mary and the other women arrive? Well, there doesn't seem to be any indication that the soldiers are still there, unconscious or petrified when the ladies arrive. But on the other hand, the presence of the angel might have distracted the ladies from noticing the soldiers. The words of Matthew 28, 11 through 16 do seem to indicate that as the women are running to tell the apostles about the empty tomb, the soldiers went directly to the Jewish leaders. So maybe they were still at the tomb when the women arrived. It's hard to tell. Uh, perhaps they'd already left, or perhaps they had just left. Maybe they were there, and the women, their attention is so distracted by the, the, uh, the tomb being opened, and the angel there. Maybe they just didn't see the men. Well, let's read the text anyway. Matthew 28, 11 through 16. While they were going, that is, as the women went to tell the disciples, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. When they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this, if, if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Friends, these pagan soldiers are eyewitnesses 
not just of an empty tomb, but also the angel and his rolling back of the stone. They saw that part. They didn't see Jesus being resurrected, but they saw the angel roll the stone back. In fact, they all you know, became paralyzed at the sight of that. Surely, as they come back to tell the Jewish leaders the story of what's happened, surely this will be enough to convince them that in fact, Jesus has risen from the grave just as he said he would. And in fact, he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Oh, but no, it would have sooner convinced the Roman soldiers than these Jewish leaders whose hearts were so hardened to the truth of God. Instead, their response is to bribe the soldiers to lie. You tell his disciples tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now notice they bribed them to do that. And this is a big deal because you see, if it becomes no, becomes known, let me try that again. If it becomes known that they fell asleep, they could all and should all legally lose their lives. They are Pilate's guard. And so the Jewish leaders say, hey, if Pilate says anything, we'll take care of it. We got you covered. They had it all figured out. Friends, those Jewish leaders knew that the disciples of Jesus did not come and steal the body. In fact, we know the disciples of Jesus didn't believe in a resurrection yet. And they're scared to death. They're in hiding. These Jewish leaders know that something happened, something miraculous, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And Matthew says that the Jews were still spreading this lie about the disciples still in the body, even as he wrote his gospel. Well, again, I realized that I skipped over the interaction between the women and the angel. And actually, we're going to see there are two angels. And we're going to begin there next week as the women arrive at the tomb and they see that the, the tomb is open because the stone has been rolled back. Before we close, let's have a prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to study your holy word together. Father, I pray that the things that we've talked about will be an encouragement that it will stimulate everyone to study even deeper and to, uh, to really, really contemplate uh, what all of this means and how important it is to our understanding who Jesus is. And Father, we pray that we will strive to have the courage to step out in faith and to tell the story whenever we have the opportunity. Be with us and strengthen us, Father. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.